Yes. Yes. Okay. Right then. So let's start. So the first thing we'd like to do is we'd like to do like an introduction to snowplow and an introduction to the snowplow community. Right, so yeah, like I say, thank you for having us, Diconium. This picture must be 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I once had hair. Okay, and this is Matthias and Randall, who I've already introduced. So, this is my favourite slide because it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, like I say, it's great to be back in Berlin. We were here in May at the Omeo offices. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, for hosting us there, Omeo. Um, I've had 20 odd years in open source technology. I started as a Java programmer in the last millennium. Um, and then I emerged or evolved or devolved into a Magento consultant um, <laughs> where I would build and market. Uh, Magento websites and that involved everything from templates, data structures, all the way through to doing the SEO, CSS and even Google Analytics. Um, and as a freelancer, I did a lot of this on my own, as a freelancer in open source technology the community is really your right hand person. You can't survive without the, uh, the support of a really good community when using open source software. Um, and so, and what I also found out is that the more you get put into the community, the more you'll get out of the community in return. And so I ended up being a volunteer for the Joomla product, uh, project, which is an open source content management system. I served on their marketing committee for a while, attended lots of events, and I did something similar for Magento. And I would produce blog posts on little fixes on quirks of Magento. And what I found is the more I invested into the, these communities, it became like a go-to-market strategy for me. That people would actually come to me and ask me to do work for them because they'd found me on a blog or they'd met me at a conference or something. Um, and then in 2019, I became a community professional. And there's a reason you've got speech marks there. Um, it's not like you're a doctor, there's no entrance exams. So it's professional in speech marks. Um, I first worked as a community manager for Alfresco, which is an open source electronic document and records management system. Um, they were acquired by Highland, a very big American company. And I was then interviewed for Snowplow. Highland were <coughs> kind of a, an odd mix, or it didn't fit very well. But then I was interviewed for Snowplow and I met Yali and Alex. I was kind of like, where do I sign? Because this was a company that really understood community and open source. So, Snowplow has been around 10 years. So let's have a quick look at the Snowplow project and community over 10 years. So I'm not going to read all these stats, if you can see the stats. Um, but 700,000 hours of open source code, that's what we've estimated. Um, we've had 1,800 forks, 1,000 pull requests. So this is the community helping build a project and build the product. We've got something like 4,000 people in forums. This year, we've seen a 21% increase in activity across GitHub and the forums. So people are getting involved. The project is really moving on, and that's really, really great news. Um, we had 11 meetups this year. I think I'm meet up out. I'm looking forward to Christmas. Um, we, like I say, we have one in Berlin with Omeo, London, Amsterdam, Sydney. Glo we're global, even Boston. Um, we've hosted eight office hours, and we hope to distribute this uh, slide deck so there's links to the office hours and recordings from previous meetups. And we also have sponsored seven meetups. And if you're into digital analytics, I recommend going along to Measure Count. They're really, really great. Um, but what we'd really encourage people to do is get involved with the project. If you're a Snowplow user, like I say, the more you invest in the community, the more you'll get out of it, both as a developer and a user of Snowplow. 
Um, so if you find something in our docs or in our GitHub repository which is not right, there's an issue, please raise it. Uh, we've got Nick Stanchenko here, our open source manager. He's responsible for picking up those bits from GitHub if there are issues, aren't you, Nick? Yes. Um, blame him. Blame him. Yes. Um, also, discourse on, our me on Measure Slack. People are always asking questions. We'd love it if you know the answers to those questions, if you get involved. Um, with office hours, it's tended to be us talking to you about what we've done with the product. We would love you to talk to us about how you're using our product as well. Some of the lessons you've learned about using Snowplow. Um, so we would love to have more contributions from our community uh, on office hours. And my email address is here. If you've got a story to tell, get in touch. Um, similarly, meetups. If you fancy doing a presentation, get in touch with me. If you've got a good snowplow story, we're really keen um, to allow you to tell a story. Particularly if you've got great offices like here to host, we'd really like to hear from you. So does that mean that if they have something great to share, they reach out to you, and if there's something to complain about, they reach out to Nick? Yes, that's, what he's that saying? Is, that's our division of labor. That's the perfect division of labor. Very efficient. I, I get like the that. love, he gets the complaints. Um, Measure Camp, we've sponsored seven last year. We'll be continuing to sponsor them next year. There will be one in Berlin. There will also be one in Munich. And there will be one in Vienna. So if you fancy going to any of those, they're really great events. And Chris will be talking briefly about the data product accelerators. We see those as kind of blueprints, as recipes. If you've got an idea for a DPA, we'd love to hear about it. I think there are great uh, potential for community contributions about how you use Snowplow as a DPA. And so we'll, this coming year, We'll have meetups in Berlin, Vienna, Amsterdam, London, Boston, hopefully San Francisco as well. So if you're in San Francisco, pop along and say hello. I know it's unlikely, but there you go. Um, we will be at uh, Measure Camp probably in Vienna and Copenhagen, possibly in Munich. So if you're there, come along and say hello to us. Uh, we'll also be sponsoring Web Analytics Wednesday, which is kind of like Measure Camp, but not quite, uh, in Copenhagen and Columbus, Ohio. And we hope to be working with EML Ops communities in New York and London, uh, sponsoring events and talking those events. I think we're hoping to do one in New York in March. So again, if you're in New York in March, you know, drop in, say hello. Um, so this is what we're hoping to do in 2023. If you've got any ideas, any suggestions, you know where to get in touch with me. It's eddie at snowplow.io. Right, thank you very much. I'll pass you over to Chris. Okay. So guys, you think I need the mic? Or is it okay without? It's okay? Because I prefer not... Mike? 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 Okay. Oh, all good. So let's get on. First of all, I'm totally happy to have you all in the room here. I'm super happy to be with you. And I'm totally stoked, to be honest, to be back in this. Why back? Because in 2016, my agency was essentially organizing the first couple of snowplow events in Germany, or meetups, I should say. So now it feels like the circle closes, standing here with this badge on my, on my uh, well, shirt, whatever. And it's great to see the momentum and it's great to see how the company has developed, but it's even better to see how the community has developed. We've brought a couple of stats next to what Eddie's just showed, and I think it's mind-blowing to see the growth. And I'm super happy and super grateful to have all of you being part of this. I joined Snowplow relatively recently, around two months ago, as their global chief data officer, as well as being responsible for growing the region of DACH, so Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So I'll be a guy, I'm living here in Berlin, so we can come meet every time or any time, talk about whatever questions you have. Again, I'm only for two months, so if you have any fancy technical question, we brought a couple of very smart people along that can answer all of them for today. But if you want to have a chat going forward, I'm super happy 
to receive you in our non-existing Berlin office yet. But we'll make it, we'll make it. Before I joined Soplar, I was working on the agency side for the last 10 years. So I have a slightly different background than most of the people at Snowplow. I've been consulting companies on building their data strategies, building their data stacks, helping them to carve out use cases and to essentially turn all of what they're doing into tangible business value. Mostly in larger organizations, but also a lot in startups and grown-ups. So if you have any questions around that, let's have a chat. Open source, whatever you want to get in touch with us, please do it, do it, do it. I'm open, especially in this first year. I'm not saying I have nothing to do because then Yali gives me a ton of stuff to do, but I still have time. Please, let's meet up, have a coffee, and see what we can make out of that. My main message here for you is we're here to stay in Berlin for the first time ever. We're emphasizing the Berlin region in particular. Come to us, talk to us in German if you prefer. We're now here. 24-7. Again, give me a call. There's no office to come by, but we'll get that sorted out as well. So we felt that it's very worthwhile to talk a little bit about what Snowplow is and why we are around. Obviously, we'll have two in-depth talks later by Decomium and Penta. But from a very high level perspective, we still receive so many questions around what it is, what's the difference, why do people use it, et cetera, that we felt is very worthwhile just showing you a couple of slides, setting the idea or the narrative, and then going deeper into the talks by the community. We feel this is hopefully helpful for you to take most out of this evening. So let's start with why we do what we do. We believe that, or we actually see, that companies have piled up a tremendous amount of data over the last years. 10, 15 years ago, most of the chats that I saw or I had were about, we need to desperately collect more data. You know, we can't track online marketing, things like that. But that has completely changed. I think companies are drowning in data these days. They are not sure how to handle the masses they have acquired. It has been a long while that somebody came to me saying, oh, I'm missing so much of what I should be able to track. I mean, of course, there's always something we would wish you have. But in the end of the day, there's just too much to handle it. And just by working on a technology stack alone won't change anything. You can build the best stack in the world. This problem will stay, because it's not a technical one in nature. The big problem that arises is that while the amount of data has completely increased over the last years, unfortunately, the level of insights has not. I'm not saying that people do not get any insights from that data, of course. But what I'm saying is it's not proportional to the amount of data that have been amassed and piled up. And this is interesting, and it's also very challenging. A lot of companies react by just hiring more people. Oh, we have so much data. We have so many insights we don't have. Let's add a few more engineers and analysts, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not exactly scalable. Then people came up with data mesh and all of the sorts of fancy things. But the problem remains. We have just a ton of data, and unfortunately, and that's what we're going to look at, the data isn't in the shape that's, let me say, ready to use. And I explain what I mean with ready to use on the next slides. When we look at what companies say, and what research companies like Gartner and Forrester and the others out there say, it's a shift of paradigm, I'm almost tempted to say. Let me quote this. We don't want lots of data. We only want the data that makes us smarter. I guess it's easy to say I agree to this. The problem is obviously, what is the data that makes us smarter? And what subset of the data is very likely to make us smarter? Because you don't know in advance. I just want to make the point here that while we do have tons of data, there's also a risk associated with it. Because let me say, data that's not available in the quality that we need it can actually lead to biases. It can lead to wrong decisions, wrong insights, and wrong recommendations. And why does this matter for Snowplow? Now, look, here's how we see it. Almost no data set, not only speaking about the amount of data, but almost no data set as such is deliberately created with advanced analytics or AI in mind. Most of the data sets we have and we use every day, especially in the data teams, is 
pulled from some existing applications. It could be in your own backend apps, it could be Salesforce, it could be Google Ads, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The idea is always the same. The data that you get from these tools fits the purpose of this tool. And it makes a lot of sense. If you were to develop an app, you would obviously develop a data model that fits the app too. But now suddenly, there are so many people working in data, and they need to use this data to consume it, put it together, give it meaning, and derive insights from it. And the problem is, that's a typical status quo of what we've seen in our consulting projects over the last years. People pull it together, step one, then they sometimes reverse ETL or reverse engineer, sorry, not ETL, reverse engineer the logics of these tools just to get the transformational or the, the, um, the data that is optimized in a, for transformational systems or transactional systems, sorry, get that into a format that we want for analytics or in our warehouse or data lake. You reverse engineer that logic, you denormalize it. You spend a lot of time identifying if that data is even what it's supposed to be. Think about quality issues, for example. You spend a lot of time understanding the compliance, if you're lucky at all to understand how that data was created by these tools originally. And after all, we see data teams spend the vast majority of their time just on preparing the data for doing the actual work that I think is much more valuable to the company. I'm not saying that's not valuable to the company because obviously it doesn't fall from the sky, so somebody has to do it. But ideally, we would be spending much more time on using the data to create meaningful insights for the business or to empower advanced use cases around AI or whatever it is. Now, given that most of these data sets are byproducts from existing applications and pulling is all together, just making use of what's there, what's dubbed data exhaust. Well, that leads us into an interesting, I would say, challenge. And that challenge is in particularly huge around behavioral data. Or, in the broader terms, all data related to your customers. And that's a big problem for companies. If that data set isn't top-notch, it's not exactly what you need, the amounts of insight that you can gain from it are much lower. And why is that an issue? Because behavioral data, the way that people interact with your product or service or brand or company, depending on how you want to call it, all the interactions that people have with you, they are essentially showing you why people made decisions and how they came to this decision. We think it's one of the most valuable data sets around there. We all have customers. The business model can be whatever it is. We all have customers, and we all want to understand how our customers deal. We all want to understand why they make the decisions. We all want to understand why they buy from us or not. And we have all that in common, no matter how the business model exactly looks like. But this is where it's getting very tricky, right? Understand why decisions were made by our customers or users and being able to predict that. It's one thing to understand what happened yesterday or a month ago or whatever. It's the next thing to understand why it happened. But what most people are really looking forward to is understanding what will happen. Because that's what I can influence. From the past I can learn, but the future I can influence by the learnings that I have. So if we were able to predict reliably what our users are going to do, wouldn't that be great? I think it would be great. A lot of companies are doing that already, but doing that at scale is very difficult. There are different categories of challenges. One of that is technical nature. If you're into digital analytics or tracking over the last years, we've seen ITP popping up. We have seen countless debates about cookies. We have seen countless issues around ad blockers, data coverage, Companies are not tracking 100% or let's say 90%, 95%, whatever it exactly was for everyone, like they used to for many years down the road. They are now suddenly missing 20, 30, or even more percent of their entire data set from the user data. And that's a big problem. There are many more technical ones. When things get more complicated, understanding the lineage is, so where does the data originate from? It's super complicated. Like imagine you have a full warehouse setup, you have spent countless hours with multiple people working this out, and then there's an error. It doesn't really look quite correct. Understanding where this 
comes from. What's the root cause of this? It's so much more difficult than it sounds like. I guess most of you have been, have been actually experiencing that, so you know what I'm talking about. But questions like this make it difficult to do this at scale. The next thing is the organizational part. If you ask me personally, I think that's the biggest problem. It's by far the biggest problem companies have. I know we all need to get the best tech out there. We need to work on it. And we need to, we all want to create a modern version. Now I'm trying to avoid the modern data stack word, but you know, we, we try to make it as modern as it should be to solve and suit our needs. But the organization needs to catch up. Most of the discussions that I had on my consulting site with the larger setups of data that have been created were actually on understanding how to make use of that data inside the organization. It was around governance, for example. Do we all share the same understanding of this super important KPI? Honestly, not even at Snowplow internally we share the same understanding of all the KPIs. And we're a data company. So you can imagine, probably also from your own experience, that is a challenge. And that's problematic. If you want to scale the usage of data and the insights you create, that is problematic. But there's only one of that. There's a data quality issue. <laughs> Look, I can't recall how often I've been told, like, Chris, I've opened that report and it looks fishy. It's, it, it can't be correct. And yeah, because data quality issues are not the exception. They are unfortunately happening every single day in many companies. And yet, most of them have not invested time and resources in making sure that doesn't happen again. We do think there's a lot that you can do, and I'll show you a couple of ideas later in the presentation, but it's a topic that's super serious. Because if the quality isn't right, well, all the insights that you derive from it are probably also not right either. That's a huge problem for companies. Then we have the whole compliance part. I don't want to comment too much on what has been happening in the last couple of months around you know, authorities trying to bash GA and a couple of other tools, trying to, let's say, hope that we get a new privacy shield up and running again for all the US services, seeing again that the moment it pops up, Trump's is again firing against it. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm saying, please do it for the sake of the users. But it's not helping the people dealing with tracking. It's not helping us to gain more data. So it creates a lot of uncertainty in the market. And companies, unfortunately, have to deal with that. There's no way to hide from it. You don't want to be the, pl the one blamed in your company because you didn't see it coming that betting on this tool or doing it this way or not finding out that you have personal identifiable information directly in your data set and nobody told you. You are tracking maybe email addresses into Google Analytics or something else. No, no, you probably shouldn't. And the point is, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand that. It's difficult to comply to GDPR. And I'm not talking only about the obvious basics that everybody talks about, like tracking consent. Yeah, that's part of it, but that's really only part of it. So there's a lot that companies need to deal with. And that has serious and severe implications on the outcome and on data teams. I brought a couple of codes here. Gartner says 87% of all AI and advanced analytics projects will never make it to production. Never. I could rephrase that and say almost 90% of the work is uh, wasted or a learning. Let's call it a learning, maybe. 20% <laughs> of analytics insights will deliver outcomes. It's kind of going in the same direction, obviously. But everything that you think you find out does not move the needle. That's what it says. It does not help the company to grow or to become more profitable or whatever it is. And that's on average. I'm obviously not talking about you, and you're here, you know, because you care a lot about these topics, but that's an average for the market. That means a lot of people working in our field are looking to change the job because they are fed up, I would say. They're fed up with the situation in their company, they are fed up with whatever it is, but that's not very helpful for companies either. And the last thing is, 64%, that's what Forrester says, is of data teams have too much data to even meet, realistically meet, their demands and requirements for compliance. And that basically means more than every second company is not compliant to what they should be. 
And that's quite a bummer, I think. That's a huge risk for your business. And even despite the fines that could come from this, it's a huge loss of reputation if you get called out on that. So obviously, the question is, what can we do against it? And our answer, our part of the answer for all these complex topics is building Snowplow. We've built Snowplow to create the best possible and highest quality data set to empower your customer related use cases in real time. So, okay, let's go one step back. To create the best possible and high quality, highest quality data, that's something we'll look into in a few minutes. We feel the data not being good enough, what it could be, is one of the root causes for the weaknesses and the insights that companies can derive from it. And at the same time, we believe the customer data set, and particularly or the behavioral data around customers, why they are doing things they do and how they are doing it, is one of the most important ones that you have. We believe it's more important than, let's say, transactional data, for example, which is the result of a lot of happenings, let's say a purchase in an e-commerce store. It's the result of hundreds of things happening before. I would rather want to know about 100 things happening before than just the fact that somebody purchased. Because that's a data set I can learn from. That's a data set I can predict from. Let's be open and transparent. Snowplow does not have the reputation for being the most easy, simple to use tool on the planet. I get that. I know people will quote me on that. I know people will hate me for that internally. But you know, it is like it is. Or it was like it is, I should say. Snowplow has invested a significant amount of time in making it more friendly and simple to use. We've just released a new quick start one for GCP with BigQuery, in case you're on GCP and using BigQuery, to make it that super simple. But yes, with all this, there's a certain amount of complexity that comes with it. However, we think it's companies like you taking these issues that we talked about before serious that would benefit the most by the solution. It's not the tool that you just sign up in two minutes, you know, do press, uh, press three buttons, and then everything is automatically done for you. And you will see what we mean by that. We're 100% first party, meaning that the typical deployment model is you run it on your own, or you host it on your own, or we run it for you. I'll talk, you about, uh, talk about this in a minute. But it means you're not reliant anymore on a third party tool collecting all this valuable, confidential user data for you. You can do it on your own. You can host it on your own. You can look at the pipeline. You know every single step. It's even open source, obviously. So you can see everything that's going on all the time. And there's nobody else looking at the data. There's nobody that can even look. Not even we can look at the data if we run the pipeline for you in our commercial offerings. So that's a tremendous shift. And we think. This private SaaS deployment model is something that's really here to stay. And in Germany in particular, with so much uncertainty around GDPR and so on and so on, I think it's the best way going forward, taking data seriously as a first party asset. Snowplow was founded in 2012. We've raised funding rounds. There's 1.7 million websites having their tracker deployed. It's quite massive. I was shocked seeing that number. There's 170 employees. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, I can't just not say it enough, that happened on the product side in the last couple of years. And I can compare it to 2016 when I used it for a couple of my clients. It has been a tremendous effort by Snowplow, but also by the community to take this to the next level and make it a product of all of us. A classic logo slide, I couldn't go without it, but I think the key point is you will probably recognize some of the logos, and some of them are definitely what we would call leading in the industry. Whether it's N26 on the finance side, Omeo, Flixbus, Commerzbank, or DBT. Even DBT is using uh, Snowplow as an open source version, making sure that it can track and understand what's going on. And I think that's quite a statement. That's a data company that probably 90% of you are using, and I love to say they're also using Snowplow. Unfortunately, I wish we were as big as them, but maybe that comes. What is it that companies are typically doing with Snowplow in the end of the day? We've categorized the use cases that we see in, in these five columns, marketing, product, sales, customer or service, and compliance. I don't want to go into all of them. I just highlighted a few ones that we see very regularly. So if you are using Snowplow or you are about to use Snowplow, there's a good chance that you will find yourself in these bold ones. 
whether it's marketing effectiveness and performance measurement, the attribution around it, better targeting, retargeting, pre-targeting of advertising. On the marketing side, it's product analytics, a classic one for us, feature optimization, improving a user experience, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess you can read that afterwards. I think the best way to sum this slide up is using Snowplow once, implementing it as the baseline, as the platform, and then putting all your future use cases on top of it. That's how we want to look at it, at least. We want to build a platform for you to run everything afterwards on it, but you don't have to do the heavy lifting of the platform itself. That's how it looks like. That's most often the slide that most technical-oriented people like stare like, star like this. We have a lot of time afterwards to, to talk about the details, so I, I won't, I won't spawn, uh, spend like 20 minutes on that one. But I do want to quickly highlight how it works. With all the generation of the data, the data creation, as we say, whether that's coming from apps, IoT, your website, server, backend systems, whatever it is, all of that data goes into one single pipeline. It ends up in one single table. And that alone is a huge amount of time that you can save with it. The data is then, once it enters the pipeline, it's validated. So every single event, whether it's hundreds or 100 million events per day or whatever it is, is validated individually against a schema. What that is, I tell you in a minute. It's validated if it's correct. Is that what you expect from this event? Or did somebody forget half of the fields, for example? Every single event. Afterwards, all the events can be enriched, meaning you can automatically erase PII information, so person identifiable information. You can make changes to your campaign schema, for example. If you're unhappy with what was delivered from, let's say, the marketing team and the tracking parameters, you can change that in the pipeline, and there are many more. And all that comes with privacy controls. So you can make sure it's as hardened and as compliant as you or your legal team thinks it should be. Once it passes the pipeline, it ends up in usually the warehouse or the data lake. I know a couple of people will call me that that's a bit simplified. Yes, it is simplified, but I think it's, it's good for a high level view. And again, it ends up all in one unified event stream, a single atomic events table. You don't have to do all the heavy lifting from the atomic events table all the way up to a usable BI model, for example. You don't have to do that on your own. We deliver that for you. But at least it is there. And it is what we call AI and BI ready. Why is that? Because it has gone through this rigorous process of validating enrichment, meaning that everything that comes through is what you deem to be ready to be used and consumed. And the rest you will find in a dedicated space that you can deal with afterwards. You will easily see what tracking issues you have, the, let's say, data collection issues you have, and you can fix them later on so they don't appear. It's not like digging in a while, summing up sessions, and realizing, oh, there must be 20% more. That is not the case. All data is available in real time as well. So if you think about personalization of the user journey in real time, for example, you can do that from the same system. You only collect and create the data once, and you can use it for anything BI, you can use it for anything AI, and you can use it for personalization of the customer journey if that's what you want to do. Last thing I would like to call out is this entire process is governed, in, at least in the paid commercial product version, with the user interface that helps you to do this. It comes with a lot of, like a broad range of APIs to do that programmatically at scale if that's what you want to do. But I want to make sure that everybody understands this process is so critical to us that we believe it needs to be fully supported and governed at all times. And it's comparably easy with Snowplow to make sure that no data below a certain threshold of quality ever reaches your production warehouse, lake, or lake house, or whatever you have. On the compliance side, as I said, you can deploy it on your own prep. Um, private cloud for open source, that's what's anyways typically happening, but it's not so standard for commercial <coughs> offerings of other, surf, uh, as, well, other SaaS tools out there. We do bake constant information. I think that's interesting to share. We bake constant information into every single event ever passing the pipeline. So the context of when a user clicked on, yes, I accept the tracking 
uh, the tracking, or I, I give you the content basically, that information is attached to every single event throughout the whole pipeline. You can always go back and see in every single event ever happening in all of the hundreds of millions of events that you might have, this content was given at this particular time and this was the exact content that was given. We call this a GDPR context. You can attach it to all the events with a couple of clicks. You can do the same with global A-B tests, for example. If you want to run a global A-B test on your website, you say, I want to remember that this user saw version B at that particular point in time. You just create a global, what we call event context. You attach it to the event automatically, and that will never leave this single event. You can always go back and know that this person clicked three years ago. This person clicked exactly this button in this variant version that was green because you wanted to test the green color. There's all sorts of cookie-less, anonymous tracking possibilities that come with the product. You can basically configure it in a very flexible and adaptable way, whatever suits you best. We're not telling you this is the best way to do it, because honestly, there are different interpretations in the market of what is acceptable or what is the gray zone or what is OK from a legal point of view. But whatever it is that you have or your legal team feels, there's a very high chance you can just simply configure it in the product once and you can just let it run. And you won't have to change the product if your view on legal changes later on. And since you anyways host it on your own, well, I think you're very well covered. Eddie called out data product accelerators. Over the years, we've realized, we've realized that we do not see enough or a fast enough time to value for our users. It was taking too much time until the first insights for the business came out. What we want to call out for you guys is the data product accelerators that give you the blueprints that Eddie talked about, out of the box, ready to deploy. Just put them on your pipeline, and they will work. Obviously, they're not customized to your specific situation, but they're blueprints. And one of the blueprints, for example, is building a composable customer data platform, a composable CDP, on top of Databricks with a couple of other partners on top of Snowplow Data, and you just deploy it and you can test basically how it is to have your own composable CDP within a couple of hours. Again, that's obviously only the tip of the iceberg to get started, but it's very helpful from our experiences for the users to learn and to create fast time to value. Advanced schemas is something that has, Snowplow has carried along all the time. We believe that everything that ends up in the pipeline is ideally covered by a schema. Schema is essentially a human as well as a machine readable description of what you put into the pipeline or what you expect. This is also used to automatically generate the right tables afterwards in the warehouse or in the lake. So you don't have to do that either. You can make it as hardened as you want. You can say, I want to require all fields all the times, making it extremely high quality, but probably also have a lot of fallout. Or you can make it very loose and say, only the user ID is absolutely required, and the rest is OK if it's not there. It's totally up to you, and that flexibility is a key strength for Snowplow, we think, and it leaves you to do it the way that you want. And if you have been participating or heard about the data contract discussion, for example, this is essentially it. You can create data contracts with Snowplow between data producers and consumers and making sure the data arrives exactly in the way that it's intended to be. And if it's not, it will get flagged for you, it will be put on this desk, and you can check out what was the issue. Fix it, and then put it into the pipeline again. As I said before, I'm going to go into detail about it. All data, everything is available in real time, and you can make use of it for personalization, for real-time dashboards, real-time campaign monitoring, whatever you think is most interesting, from the same set of data and the same pipeline. People typically build customer behavioral data profiles, and then they expose them, for example, via a small API to the front end of the website, making sure that you as user just see what is most likely interesting to you and not the rest. Historically, people have been adding different sets of tools to make this happen. We think it's such a core logical piece based on the behavioral data that we want to offer it out of the box. If some of you are interested in understanding what our commercial offering is about, please give us a shout today. I think one thing to remember is it helps you around the workflows of doing everything that we just talked about with the UI, with APIs. It also helps you to do the heavy lifting. So essentially, it's like open source, but at the same time, it's not like open source because you don't have to do anything, literally anything, because we run it entirely for you, but in your own cloud environment. That's our commercial product offering. 
I'm very happy to share more about that later, but that's not the focus of today. If you want to get started with Snowplow, there's different ways on doing that. There's the open source quick start. I guess most of you might have seen that already. That gives you recipes that are easy to use, easy to, um, easy to employ on your cloud. Terraform scripts, for example, that you can use to get up started fast. Again, we just released GCP and BigQuery as an updated receipt. That's making it much easier than ever before. There's also Try Snowplow. It's a hosted version. It's essentially a demo environment, if you will. You sign up, you have 14 days. You don't have to do anything on the tech side. You can just see how everything works. You can track data, etc. But after 14 days, it's basically gone. It won't appear overnight, obviously, but it's not supposed to be used after that. But you don't have to do any technical setup on your own first. With BDP Cloud, just recently released, which is a cloud-hosted version, we run it for you forever. And then BDP Enterprise is what we call the private SaaS model. We run it for you, and you can focus on dealing with insights, but it still runs in your own cloud entirely. The data never leaves your environment. There's one very last question that I want to wrap up here. Is It's a standard question that we receive every week, which I guess is unsurprising, and that's, is Snowplow a better Google Analytics or just a different analytics or something like that? I'm not a fan of comparing tools. I think all the tools have been built for a specific purpose. And for that purpose, these tools are probably best. Now, for us, we think when a data team asks us, should we consider Snowplow versus GA? It's a different question than if I say I'm a paid search marketer logging into Google Analytics into the interface, understanding how my campaigns run. It's just a different perspective, if you will. But for those of you in the data field, this is why we have built Snowplow. And we do believe in a couple of points, Snowplow is a very strong alternative for you to consider if you're running on GA. One is to focus. Marketing is one aspect of data in a company, but it's not the only one. We believe there's much more that you need to do right, and we do target at a much more data savvy audience, but we also bring more, let me call it, pro features for the data people along. For example, the schema topics. That's something we recently got with GA4, but it's not comparable to what you see in Snowplow. There's a lot of black box and trust topics. Snowplow is open source. You want to know exactly what's going on? Go into the code, check it out, see if you like it. I wish I could do that with other solutions on the SaaS side out there. I've been, I can't remember how often I was surprised seeing the outcome of data. And honestly, in the end of the day, I'm not even sure what happened behind the scenes. I'm not sure what they did with the data. And I simply cannot put my hand on this fire and say, no, no, it's probably all right. No worries. I don't want to call out Google too much here, but our business model is not an advertising ecosystem. Say it like this. On the pricing side, that's the last part. If you do consider the commercial product and you don't want to deal with doing all the technical work on your own, you will see that Snowplow is typically or very often cheaper than GA360 to say to that comparison one more time. So long story short, we believe with Snowplow you get both best powerful data creation as well as full compliance, first party, completely controlled on your own. And if that's appealing to you, well, then I think it could be a better Google Analytics for you. And if you say that's not so much what I'm interested in, I'm more interested in the crazy integrations that Google brings into the marketing ecosystem with DV360 and the marketing platform, et cetera, then that's probably the better tool for you. That's maybe as easy as it is to sum it up. Guys, thanks a lot for listening. I hope we could shed some light on what Snowplow is and why it could make sense to have a look. I'm so happy that you're all here, that you're part of the community, and would love to talk about this deeper with you later on. Thanks, Matthias.